the geography of higher education in conversation with. We have Danit Gall uh, with us from the other side of the Atlantic. Uh, this uh, meeting, uh, as usual, is organized in cooperation, in partnership with uh, ERIA, with Julia Aymon and Hassan. Uh, so I give uh, the floor to Julia without further ado to introduce our speaker. And I thank you very much for participating uh, to this uh, event. Thank you, Raffaele, and we are very pleased to have with us today Danit Gall uh, to discuss issues related to ethics in AI and also what skills we need to gain a better understanding of these very complex issues. Danit is Associate Fellow at the Leverhulme Center for the Future of Intelligence at the University of Cambridge and Visiting Research Fellow at the Rajaratnam School of International Studies of the Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. And she's interested in technology ethics, geopolitics, governance, and also safety and security. She's also been uh, an advisor and a technology advisor at the United Nations uh, on the uh, implementation of the United Nations Secretary General Roadmap for Digital Cooperation. She's involved in a number of uh, IEEE bodies and also founding editor and editorial board member of Springer's AI and Ethics Journal. And she's also in the executive committee of the AI for SDGs Cooperation Network at the Beijing Academy of AI. A very international background, uh, putting together uh, different contexts uh, uh, that could also have different opinions on the ethics of AI. And this is why I think we will have a very interesting conversation today. But Given the complexity of the topic, let's make the most of our time and let's start immediately with our first question. Dani, I would like to ask you uh, a short question that probably deserves a quite a long answer. That is, what skills do we need to uh, live and work in a world that uses AI? Over to you. Thank you so much and hi from New York. Um, just public service notice. Um, if you can hear background noise, I apologize for that. Uh, life goes on, even though COVID um, interrupted it. But uh, to answer the question, I mean, the one thing I want to say is let's all just take a collective deep breath and understand that we don't all have to be developers. We don't all have to be regulators. We don't all have to have all of these skills together to work on AI, to think about AI, to really make an impact um, in artificial intelligence. It's a uh, a mysticized technology that a lot of people seem to think will revolutionize, will change the world, um, maybe not really do so much. But I think at the end of the day, it touches upon all of our decisions and all of the, our daily actions, you know, using technical services, navigation, online shopping, um, infrastructure, electricity, it really is all around us. And we need to recognize that we can all participate and we should participate. Now, I think that in terms of the skills that we should be emphasizing, we need to really emphasize interdisciplinary and tran uh, transferable skills and really ones that can help us kind of cut, cut across different topics. So if you think about um, critical thinking, creativity, problem solving, generalization, a lot of things like that. Uh, but if you came here to really ask for a, a checklist of uh, um, skills, I'm not going to give it to you uh, because no one else can give it to you at the end of the day. I don't think anyone can come and say, these are the skills that we need to deal with AI, or these are the skills that we need to deal with with the future. That just, it doesn't hold. Different people excel in different skills. And when they bring them together, um, that's really what makes the difference. And that's also how we differ from AI, because AI is very good at doing something very particular. And humans are very good at cutting across different topics. I mean, the question of skills is essential. And it's essential because the more we deal with technology, the more competent we need to become. And there's a name for it, it's called the automation paradox. And the automation paradox happens in three stages. The first stage is um, AI and these systems are used to correct human behavior. So if you think about autocorrect, when you type and it corrects you, um, it's just kind of the, something that is assisting you, it's kind of in the background, it helps you, and um, it kind of makes your life a bit easier. In the second step, it actually ends up um, replacing a lot of the things that you do and you end up relying on it. And you now find that you type a little like more clumsy and you don't really mind because you know it's going to get there. Um, if you think about autopilots or autonomous driving, then you don't really pay attention to the road or you kind of take a nap or an autopilot and you rely on the system. And then in the third stage, the system fails because all systems fail. 
Um, and when they do, you need to be extra skillful to take over the machine in a in kind of a manner that you didn't know was going to happen because we only kind of notice technology when it fails miserably. And you know, people get left in the dark for hours because their Google Home <laughs> got disconnected. Um, and it fails in ways that require you to be very skillful to operate. And that's why this, the question of skills is so essential. Another thing that we should talk about is we often talk about complementary, complementary skills, how we develop complementary skills. And I want to emphasize maybe one of the most important takeaways from this conversation. We should not be developing, developing complementary skills. AI should be developed to supply and provide complementary skills. We should prioritize our skills and we should design AI to make sure that it supports what we do, not replace us. And I think that is one of the most pressing issues to date because AI is designed to replace us. It is designed to take these tasks and excel at them and take that competency away from us. And I think that is the root of the ethical dilemma that we have with AI replacing us, with agency being eroded. I think it's a, it's a pressing ethical matter, but it's also a very serious problem um, that we have with people designing AI to replace us. So that's kind of the main takeaway that I would like to, to take away from this. Um, one last thing that I want to talk about, which is kind of the, 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 the need for skills in the future of jobs. Um, a lot of people are talking about the loss of jobs to AI and how AI is, again, being developed and designed to replace us. One of the things that we're seeing um, is almost a divide between very high-end jobs where manage, you know, very senior managers, executives run the company, they make the money, they buy the AI, and they get to keep their jobs. And on the other end of that scale, you have very low end jobs that are just not cost efficient to automate. A street cleaner costs less than a robot cleaning the street. Um, and because of that, we're starting to see this gap, a very, very wide gap that's opening in between. And that's why we tend to think about what are the skills that we need? How can we transform the labor market? How can we prepare people for that future? But I wanted to actually challenge that because there's a very serious crisis in the kind of job market, the replacement situation that we have been discussing that is not this widening gap. Actually, when you look at what AI is doing, AI is not replacing labor market. It does not replace um, kind of factory workers. It does not replace, te replace teleworkers. It does not even replace software developers. What it does is it manages them. It actually transforms into their boss. And if you look at an Amazon warehouse, you will find that there are hundreds of warehouse workers uh, who load and unload boxes and prepare for shipments, but there are only two or three managers. And those two or three managers walk around with a computer with an AI telling them, this worker is not fast enough. We recommend that you fire them. This worker did not provide the right package. We recommend that you have a conversation with them. Actually, at the end of the day, AI ends up managing us. It ends up becoming our boss. So all of these low-end uh, workers still continue to work. Uh, AI even, by the way, bosses development, uh, software developers that end up making the AI. Just consider how mind-boggling that is. Um, so the skills that we're going to need are going to be skills that are defined by AI because that is the metric. You do not work fast enough. You did not put the right package. And I think that is, it really speaks to, to the core of the problem is that the skills we need to develop have to extend beyond that, because if AI manages us, it ends up running us into the ground. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Danit. Uh, I, was, I was trying to, to figure out if I should change the background picture for this uh, uh, webinar. I wanted to put something from Tears in Rain from Blade Run, you know, to-, <laughs> to That would have been discuss. appropriate. Yeah, exactly. I, I, my, my digital skills were not fast enough in the last five minutes I had. But uh, I mean, th that's a good point in the sense, what is the role of higher education institutions in all of this? In the sense, uh, you know, how they can make uh, more inclusive the kind of uh, skills uh, that uh, you know, people need to be equipped with uh, to deal with this digital uh, future? And how do you see uh, the role of higher education in uh, lifelong learning, uh, uh, you know, uh, challenging a little bit the status, the mainstream narratives, uh, providing people with critical thinking, uh, not necessarily young people. Thank you, Danit. I mean, I've been thinking about this a lot for the past couple of days, and the conclusion that I've reached, perhaps uh, wrongly so, 
is that higher education institutions or in, in general, education and training institutions are the cradle of ethical thought, but they're also the cradle of AI. At the end of the day, AI was developed by professors at a university uh, in the 1950s. And it was continuously developed by these professors because if you remember the kind of AI kind of summer and winter um, cycle, there wasn't really a lot of funding. So the academia really took most of the grunt in terms of developing AI. I think at the end of the day, it really all comes down to these higher educational institutions and these educational and training institutions because they can make the most change. We often talk to regulators and ask them for better regulation. We talk to developers and ask them for something a bit more mindful. We talk about ethics, but at the end of the day, we're really not touching on the core of the issue. And this was just this kind of a amazing realization that I said, well, actually um, educational institutions are the key. They are the answer to this. And if we figure this out, then I think making that kind of change and instituting it really from the bottom up is going to be much easier. So I'm actually really excited about this talk. Um, I mean, I think that higher uh, education institutions have a problem. Uh, and when I say they have a problem, they have several. Uh, and I'm sure that's not going to be surprising uh, to anyone. So one of the key problems that I have is that a lot of the education kind of molding scheme happens full time, very intensive degree. You come in, you matriculate, you graduate, you, you, you move on. Um, unless you stay in academia and then you take on several degrees. And then you kind of stay and maybe you become a professor and then you, maybe you kind of, kind of get integrated into the higher education life. But for a lot of people, it's kind of a, a one and done, you know, one stop shop where they get education, they get the degree, they learn what they need and they move on. They go to the labor market, they go do whatever they want. Um, and that kind of mold is not going to work. And it's not going to work because time passes, technology develops, things change. And we have a very hard time keeping up with those changes. And from, you know, from, being, from being a child to being a graduate or you know, of, of an advanced degree, you're very much used to having people teach you and tell you what is going on and interact with you and teach you how to think about things and teach you how to ask questions. And if you don't like the answer, compose a better answer um, that is cited and robust and then can actually deal with the situation. And all of a sudden, you're kind of left floating um, in an issue that keeps on changing and keeps on advancing. And I think that model of like one and done degree is just not going to work. So I'm going to kind of offer something that may not sound very popular, but actually turning these higher education institutions into community centers. Uh, and that I think is the essence of lifelong learning. Something that if I am 40 and I want to, to learn about something new, I can actually go on campus and I can take a night class and I can interact with other people who are my age or care about that. And I can, the campus becomes open to me. It's not something that I go for to, to have a degree and then something that I return to when my kids have a degree. It's something that kind of creates a center of knowledge around it. And that to some extent does exist online, but online experiences tend to be, or at least from the courses that I've taken online, they weren't as satisfying. You didn't really get to the heart of the issue. You didn't get to really debate. You didn't really get to ask all the difficult questions. You kind of just have a screen, someone's talking at you. You're like, oh, this sounds great. Okay, I don't agree with this and you kind of move on. Um, so that's one key issue. Another key issue that actually Raphael mentioned um, earlier on is the silos of topics within the education system. You kind of tend to distinguish and differentiate between humanities, between technology, between science, between communication. Um, some topics have their own stigmas and they don't really interact. And I think that is the biggest problem that we have in developing interdisciplinary transferable skills because we are just kind of caught in this book, you know, figuring out equations or figuring out uh, this political system from the 16th century. And we don't really get to see much crossover. Um, I personally went to undergraduate in an interdisciplinary center where they tried to tackle that. We were able to take coding courses with economics, with uh, social science, with communication, with biology. And that was really awesome. Um, that's why I chose that school and it really shaped the way that I am able to think about things because now I try to look for different angles um, and it, it really enriched my own experience. So it is something that is possible. It's just that education systems are so stuck in that mold. Again, the one and done degree of a very specialized topic kind of you know, churning out subject matter experts. And that's, a, that's the second issue. A third issue that I'm gonna to touch on really, really quick is ivory towers. 
um, which should not exist because also ivory trade is legal. So please stop it. Um, the problem that we have right now is that you tend to concentrate a lot of power within the hands of experts. If you think about institutions that are really opinion leaders within academia, they tend to kind of accumulate around particular experts and they tend to have their own echo chamber. Uh, and they, they deal with groupthink and then you end up having a research institute that is really great, um, but also subscribes to a very particular type of agenda or a very particular type of opinion. And because of that, you don't really get to see diversity of voices and opinions. If you want to have true interdisciplinary or multidisciplinary transferable skills, you're going to have to integrate opinions uh, and voices and individuals that you typically do not. And we see that, for example, in the US very, very prominently because black people are completely missing from that conversation. And they end up getting, you know, they are the Amazon warehouse uh, workers and they are the teleworkers in India. And all of them are not integrated um, into this conversation. They don't really get to express their opinions. Often experts just kind of conveniently forget about them when they develop that new uh, exciting and shiny algorithm or they talk about ethical issues. And at the end of the day, they end up bearing most of the brunt because AI now manages them. So we really need to make sure that when we do create this community center, when we do create this kind of lifelong learning experience, we really make this accessible and available to everyone. And I think this will be easier for more inclusive universities. It will be much harder for more you know, prestigious Ivy League schools um, of that type. But at the end of the day, if we don't do it, I think these universities and their models are going to very slowly die and decay on us. And I'm worried about that. Thank you very much. We are having, I think, a super interesting and thought-provoking conversation. And we can also see that by the number of questions we have already got. But to conclude this round of questions before going ahead with Q&A, uh, let's continue to discuss the issue of uh, AI and ethics, which is also an interdisciplinary field because it merges ethics and technology. So it's a very complex topic. There are many unanswered questions. But what do you think is the role of education and training organization? How they can help us to get a better understanding uh, for us as individuals in the future. So just like I opened um, the, the, the previous answer, I really do think that higher education institutions and education and training institutions are the cradle of ethical thought because they teach us how to interact with these communities, um, with these values, with kind of a, what is wrong, what is right, um, what is better, what is worse. I mean, I think that a lot of these conversations that we're having about ethics are very deeply shaped by the educational system and the training system that we um, exist in. So I do think that they have a core role to play within ethics, also being able to bring a variety of experts, be it philosophers, be it lawyers, be it um, technologists, be it regulators. They are the cradle that trained all of these people to have the expertise that they have. So I think that having these conversations really within the higher education system or within education and training institutions is where the change is going to happen. Um, I mean, ethics obviously is complex. And at the end of the day, there is no right or wrong answer because it differs on the community's values and what they prefer and what they prioritize, what they need, be them collectivists, be them individualists, um, if they think something's acceptable and maybe others don't. So in that sense, ethical dilemmas are there to annoy us <laughs> and hurt us and challenge us and make us think about things. I mean, at the end of the day, if you think about the trolley question, the fact that there is no right answer, some people would prefer this and other people will prefer that. I think the one issue that we are having with ethics is that this is a wonderful exercise in thinking and complexity. Uh, and you can end up you know, having a lot of different answers, but it doesn't often translate into something that is really tangible. Because even if you go and you, fo you focus on explainability and transparency and privacy, the trolley question is still going to be there and it's still going to be as challenging, but it, in some ways it kind of feels like we are stuck on deciding what is right and what is wrong and AI just keeps surpassing us because the development just keeps on happening, happening the, the algorithms are being trained, they're being deployed, they kind of run away from us. Uh, and we, we're still thinking about this theoretical trolley that may or may not hit a person. Um, and that's one of the things that I'm most worried about in terms of where we are in discussing the ethics of AI. I do think um, that higher education institutions should definitely have a conversation about ethics, should teach ethics very proactively to different people. That is one of the interdisciplinary skills 
this critical thinking, this questioning, this problem solving um, is something that we should definitely prioritize. Uh, and also in terms of ensuring agency and ensuring that things go well for us, ensuring that technology is something that we can use as a tool and not be replaced by and then you know, have it fail on us. In terms of kind of thinking about what's next, um, I think that we should really keep an eye on programs and initiatives that are meant to offer lifelong learning. We need to look at different models that worked. We need to look at how community centers were developed and see if this is something that our universities would want to adopt, how these centers you know, shape global discussions. Because I can tell you that at the end of the day, you can have a very, very small center with a couple of very influential people and your name is everywhere. But we need to find a better model. Um, we need to find a better model that goes beyond peer reviewed papers and often very stale interviews um, and, you know, kind of maybe personal blogs that then end up being inflammatory and end up getting you in trouble. You really need to find a better way of communicating. And I think that's one thing higher education institutions must do. They really have to make things more accessible and more approachable to the general population. And yes, we have journalists for that, but Academia is the institute, this training, this education institute is what educates the entire population. Ministries of education should place a strong emphasis on science and technology communication that help people cut through the topics. Because oftentimes I see professors in classes trying to explain to their students how AI is affecting their lives, and sometimes they can't. And sometimes they actually end up giving wrong examples and students take that and they go on and they, you know, learn this truth, or maybe they don't, outside. And you could prevent that if only you made your community more, more inclusive. You brought experts from regulation, you brought experts from company, you brought experts um, from philosophy, even just within one class. You can end up covering so many topics, but just bringing in different experts to cover that. So I would definitely keep an eye out um, for initiatives and programs that do that. Um, another thing, that I think we should really do is we should think about how AI systems are affecting education. Because oftentimes we see these robots kind of replacing teachers, specifically by the way, English teachers in Asia, for example, um, who end up being oftentimes students uh, who don't really do a great job. I think we should really have a conversation about what role does AI play within the educational institution itself? What can it do? How can it help students uh, learn? How can it help tailor programs to students so that they don't get left behind? How do we avoid having you know, robots teach us whatever they want or whatever fits someone's agenda? And how does AI really affect the way that higher education evolves? Because if bosses in Amazon warehouses can be replaced and managers you know, in big companies and they end up supervising the very people who develop their own software, what is going to happen to us? What is going to happen if we're going to have AI assisted professors? What is that future going to look like? And I think we should be having that conversation, again, emphasizing the need for skills and the need to not be replaced, to kind of maintain our own agency and make sure that AI is developed to complement us. And I think higher education institutions and education and training institutions have a huge role to play in that. Um, and if you want, you can ask me about the new collar job scheme from IBM that is basically meant to replace higher education institutions um, in training their employees, kind of the, their ideal employees to deal with technology. And I think that is an interesting vision. Um, I personally found it a bit threatening, but I think that there's definitely reason to, to talk about that. Thank you very much. That is really, really interesting and would deserve much more time, time than our uh, 45 minutes. Uh, but uh, I'm really glad that we're having this conversation because again, I think that as you said at the beginning, not everybody needs to be an AI deep tech expert to just understand the flavor of this issue, which are very crucial, you know, for us as citizens, you know, in having a say uh, on how we want to shape, you know, the different futures in different countries. So uh, it's really a key conversation. But I see that we have so many questions already. So I would immediately give the floor to Anne Marie and Georgia to uh, continue the conversation with the questions from our participants. Hello, thank you. Sorry, just getting the, the uh, so as, as, as Julia was saying, we've got a lot of questions. We're gonna to try to get through as many as, as we can. Um, the first question I wanted to, to sort of build off of was, we talked a lot about higher education institutions as sort of 
um, supporting the skills that the rest of the economy need to, to manage AI, work with AI, develop AI. I, we wondered also if you had anything to say about sort of higher education institutions as users of AI themselves. And increasingly, you get into sort of um, smart tracking of students and you know, understanding you know, how many times a student is using a library, what that means to engage with the courses, a profiling of students, uh, um, and, and sort of the, the ethical issues around that, both as sort of dry, you know, it, it's users and just sort of wondering what any thoughts you might have in that area. So, I mean, I think it really, in some ways, parallels the way that um, AI is replacing managers. <laughs> I would say kind of uh, junior to middle level managers within, um, for example, Amazon warehouses. I kind of have this vision, again, that may be completely off, but I do have this vision of AI being the teaching assistant, uh, being the system that basically uses a, a camera to tell you if the student is happy or not, which, by the way, is, is complete, excuse me, bull. It really does not work. Uh, please, please stop using that and please stop relying on that. Um, it helps you grade. It helps you scan tests to see if the student nailed that particular term or if they use that particular structure. They are kind of this all powerful advanced TA that helps uh, professors better navigate their classes and better kind of interact with the students, understand if the student was able to, to um, solve that particular question or not. And we're starting to, thesis, to see this a lot as the kind of this like kind of middle level manager of the class that helps the professor interact with the class. In some ways, I think it's very useful because these, this kind of middle manager will catch nuances and things that a professor never could because uh, they have a, a large class and they need to, you know, they need to time and then they have their own lives. In, in other ways, I think it actually ends up creating a buffer between the professor and the students or the teacher and the students because the teacher relies on the analysis and the students are kind of taught or trained to very score specific points according to the algorithm. So just like um, the managers, you know, go around with the computer and say, oh, uh, employee uh, number three, I mean, you're not fast enough. Can you move it? Um, they don't really get to interact with these people. The, the AI doesn't um, optimize for happiness <laughs> or for well-being or for having a break or, you know, if you have a bad day, it doesn't care. It says, I have all these tasks and these tasks need to be done. Did you do it good enough? Yes, no. Uh, and that's kind of the decision. And on the other hand, I mean, the employees themselves or the students themselves end up trying to figure out how to please the system instead of learning, instead of developing their own critical thought, and instead of really engaging with the professors. And I think that's kind of, it creates a very dangerous buffer where the entire education system and the entire education experience turns into something that is automated, that is mechanic, that is cold, that has metrics that may or may not fit. And then if the professors want to change that, they need to go find the developers and then they need to start adjusting the system and they have to retrain that. And if you deploy it across the university, that's gonna take forever and it's gonna cost a lot of money. And yet these systems are already being deployed and a lot of people are using them because it's nice and shiny and new and it you know, makes things really easy for them. But I think the ethical dilemmas that we have are very real. Um, and I think that both the professors and the teachers and the students themselves are going to experience them. And I don't know where they're going to go to seek any remedy. I could just sort of build on that question a bit. We we're sort of talking about uh, kind of what that ethical use of AI in, in HD context looks like and, and the less good uses of AI. COVID-19 has obviously, you know, propelled a lot of institutions to digitize and digitally transform. And a lot of students are engaging with digital learning in a way that just is of unprecedented scale. You know, one side of that is potentially we're seeing a greater use of AI than we've ever seen before. Another flip side of that is a lot of people being exposed to potentially the downsides of AI in a way that they haven't before. And I just wondered whether where you're seeing a trend there in relation to COVID. And is that a positive one or one that we should be concerned about? I mean, it's both. <laughs> because there are good sides and bad sides to everything. Um, I think the biggest problem that we have specifically with COVID and with online learning is that AI is being increasingly used, but it is invisible to us. When I go into a class, does my professor tell me, hello, today I'm using an AI system to evaluate how happy you are during my class. Um, and can I come and say, well, look at all of these articles and all of the science that says what you're doing is practically nonsense. Can I do that as, as, as a student? Am I able to exercise my agency? Is a professor able to exercise their agency in saying, oh, the university wants me to use the system, but I don't think I should, and therefore I will not. 
Um, I think that one of the biggest ethical issues for me in person, um, kind of personally, is agency and our ability to consent uh, and to choose what is right and what is wrong for us. And I think having remote learning took that choice away from us uh, because it's integrated. It's integrated into the systems. Zoom made so much money. All these systems made so much money. And a lot of companies said, well, that's great. We're just going to sell all these services with, you know, uh, pseudoscience AI that is going to help you teach your class. And then they come in, the university says, oh, this looks nice, whatever. Maybe a former, you know, alumni <laughs> developed it. Um, and they end up buying it and they end up integrating and you don't have any choice in the matter. And of course, yes, at the end of the day, the professor can say, oh, well, this doesn't mean anything and toss it away. But what if it does? What if everything becomes so automated and computerized that having that kind of personal touch no longer matters? Um, so I think, yes, there are great benefits to it that you can, you know, have better nuanced understanding of your class and maybe how people interact with the material. Um, you can also automate a lot of functions that are very inconvenient. Uh, but I think at the end of the day, personally for me, I think that relying on that system causes more harm than good. And my, what troubles me most is that that harm is invisible. Uh, and we only see the harm when it kind of explodes in our faces. And that really is the, the heart of the automation paradox because by the time it explodes, we have come to rely on the system so much. It was so integrated into our lives that we need to kind of reskill in order to compensate for, for, for our loss of competence. Fascinating. I'm gonna pass over to Georgia who's got their next question. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, for, for the answer is very uh, interesting. Another question that we got in the chat uh, was, um, how do, uh, what do you think of big tech initiatives such as open AI, which uses deep learning uh, to produce human-like techs? Would, this, would these kind of, uh, of in initiatives be more useful or more harmful, harmful for uh, society at large? Thank you. I mean, the mission of open AI is to develop artificial general intelligence. Artificial general intelligence um, is the second kind of level in artificial intelligence. Let me just touch on that really quickly. The first level is narrow AI. Narrow AI can do something, one thing particularly well. It can play chess really well. Um, it can go, you know, remove nuclear waste very, very well. But if you ask it to pick a spoon up, it won't be able to do it. Um, that's narrow AI. Kind of um, general AI, um, is able to cut across different topics. And that really touches on this kind of multidisciplinary skills. It can teach itself to pick up a spoon and then it will know how to pick up a fork <laughs> and then it will know how to pick up a knife. Uh, and general level AI is pretty much the kind of ambition of uh, open AI, of deep mind of a lot of companies that are trying to create AI that is able to create and is able to teach itself. And then you have the next level, which is artificial superintelligence. And artificial superintelligence is something that is beyond human comprehension, has skills that far to the, you know, kind of exceed human skills. And the idea is, is that once we reach artificial general intelligence, it will be able to create artificial superintelligence because humans will not be able to create that. So people say that it may take years for to get from narrow AI to general AI, but it may take two minutes to get from general AI to, to kind of super intelligence uh, because we don't really know what AI is capable once we get to that level where AI could just navigate the world naturally as humans do, except better. Um, that vision terrifies me, <laughs> I'm gonna be very honest. Um, I mean, I think GPT is an interesting exercise but I think a lot of people who had conversations with it had proven that it is very problematic It sometimes I think well, some one person um, had a conversation with and recommended that you throw a revolution and you hold the government hostage uh, and then you use them to, to barter with companies. Another one recommended that someone kill themselves because life is really horrible. I mean, at the end of the day, it doesn't really understand the context of the words. It's able to churn out words in some sort of logic, uh, but it's not really able to have a conversation where the meaning, you know, they, they, they grasp the meaning of the word. And therefore they recommend holding governments hostage and, and ending your life. So I do think it's an interesting exercise. I do think it's an interesting development. I just, I don't think it's going to be that revolutionary because the meaning is not there. And language is built on meaning and communities are built on meaning. This kind of shared understanding of this is great, this is not. Uh, and I think the more we're going to see technology that doesn't have that kind of context, that isn't able to really very naturally engage with humans, 
We're not going to see artificial general intelligence yet, but we are going to see a lot of really bad accidents happen uh, where people say, oh, this is so cutting edge. I'm just going to um, you know, adopt this. And then they create a chatbot that then tells kids to, I don't know, kill themselves. It's terrifying. Thank you so much. I'll pass over the word to my colleague, Maria. Thank you, Georgia. Uh, thank you, uh, Danit, for, uh, for your insights. Just on, you know, uh, next question combines very well to what you just said about how artificial intelligence can be a little bit terrifying when used extremely. But um, one of the questions was that since AI is about problem solving, how do you think AI can actually solve the negative consequences, the biases that artificial intelligence create uh, in itself without you know, reaching the automation paradox? It can't. Um, AI is about problem solving in the sense that I, the human, define a problem that I need solving. Uh, and then I teach AI and then I, uh, you know, the, the system runs simulations uh, and then it figures out what is the best solution. Maybe it complements me in ways that um, I was not able to kind of think about before. For example, back in 2000, I think in 2008 or 2006, uh, an AI algorithm developed a new antenna from NASA that ended up being so much better than other antennas just because it was able to, to kind of figure it out. It ran simulations. It was like, oh, actually, this is the best way forward. So yes. We are at the stage where AI is able to be creative and able to kind of offer or kind of point out solutions. It cannot solve its own problems. Um, and I think that is the biggest problem that we have right now is that we're like, oh, there's, a, there's an app for that. There's AI for that. It's going to fix it. We're just going to apply it. Uh, and I see a lot of um, actually specifically CEOs of companies that pretend to, to, to use algorithms because I think we all know that 60% of companies that say they use AI, they don't. Um, they're like, that's not a problem. AI is going to fix it. Uh, AI is going to figure out biases. AI is going to audit, you know, the algorithm and the output and the data, and it's going to figure out where we're discriminating. No, it won't, <laughs> and it can't because at the end of the day, AI relies solely on the input that humans give it. Um, and databases are imperfect, and the people who make these algorithms are, let's face it, predominantly male and white. They don't really care about these things. If you think about, okay, let me give you a perfect example: Google Images. Google Images had this horrible glitch where it uh, ended up tagging gorillas as African Americans and African Americans as gorillas. Uh, and this caused a huge commotion and, and uh, you know, African Americans were obviously pissed as they should be. Do you know how Google fixed this? They removed the tag for gorillas. They just, they're not, they don't tag gorillas anymore. That was their fix. They didn't enrich their data set and they, they didn't really incorporate, you know, different communities, different colors of skins, different ethnicities. No, they just removed the gorilla tag so that now when you, when you tag people, it does no longer shows gorilla. Does that sound like a solution to you? Super interesting. Yeah, <laughs> it's not a solution at all. <laughs> uh, well, thank you very much. Um, I'll pass the floor to my colleague, Georgia, for another question. Yes, thank you so much. Uh, another question that we received is um, going back to the higher education institutions. Um, so do you think that universities right now provide the necessary skills to deal with the uncertainty and the um, unpredictability um, mixed with the you know global transformations uh, that um, that we are facing right now? Um, that are fueled also by AI and other game-changing technologies, as well as you know climate changes and its consequences. I think they're trying. Um, I do see a very positive kind of move forward in trying to tackle these issues. I do see a lot of um, classes talking about the impact of technology, really trying to integrate uh, it into curriculums. I think honestly they're moving too slow, but that's not their fault because we're all moving too slow. Um, I think that is one of their one, one of our collective problems is that we, in our minds, are still stuck in like, oh, this is so new, oh, this is so emerging. We have time to study this. This is something that's only just now happening, or in fact, it's everywhere. Um, and just to kind of illustrate that, I had in my previous role in the UN, I worked a lot with developing countries. Uh, and in developing countries, they said, well, AI is really interesting, but we still need to talk about connectivity and we still need to talk about electricity. And I said, absolutely, you do. But most of your population has a smartphone, and that smartphone has an algorithm in it that tells you what to do. You're already affected. You cannot just disconnect yourself and you know prioritize issues 
um, that are obviously incredibly important and no one is ever telling you to not pay attention to them and not really work on them, but you can't just, you know, shut yourself off. That's not how it works. And I think that's one of the biggest problems that we have is that things in academia move slowly. Um, even though new students matriculate every year, peer reviewed papers take time to be approved. You always have reviewer two kind of messing up your business. It, it really is this kind of a long process where academia is this kind of long-term institution that is resilient to change in many ways. But this is no longer the case and we're not responding fast enough. So yes, I do see efforts, I do see classes. I don't see a provost, you know, waking up in the morning and saying, well, this is not gonna work. We're gonna have to change this and we're gonna have to make, you know, sudden, critical, fast changes. Academia can do this and should, and I think we're seeing this a bit more kind of acutely in, in younger institutions that end up being a bit more agile. But at the end of the day, if you're not going to make that change and if you're not going to figure out how to make that change work for you and for your institution, you're going to be left behind. Perfect, thank you so much. Uh, I'll, I'll give the word back to Julian Raffaele. Uh, thank you, Georgia. I think that, yeah, we are almost <laughs> running out of time. It was really amazing. And I also think that many of the issues that we discussed right now with Danit uh, that, I, that emerged um, thanks to the questions of uh, participants, go back again to the issue of skills. And what Danny was saying at the beginning that we also need to blend uh, different types of skills. If we take the examples from you know, Google and how they try to fix it, it also reveals that you know, a lot of these very successful entrepreneurs and developers, they are just looking you know, at the technological aspect because you know, they were trained to be excellent technologists but maybe they were not very much trained to look at the ethical implication of this. And I think this is a big issue. So uh, I would like to go back to, the, to what Danit was saying at the beginning. We really need the skills and those are the essence of uh, uh, the entire conversation that we had today. Uh, thanks a lot. I think it was truly fascinating and I hope that we will have the chance to continue this conversation because I think are very, very, very important. And now I see that Raffaele certainly wants to say something. No, thank you, Georgia. Thank you, Danit. It was uh, extremely interesting. My takeaways are that uh, there is a problem with the semantic or the name of artificial intelligence, which should take, it should be named uh, automatic decision making for everyone or uh, automatic management of people. So artificial intelligence is a fancy name but that doesn't really reflect what it is. And then there is this fascinating discussion between individuals and communities that I think is, 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 very, is very relevant. Also because communities could shield, protect individuals from an overexposure to, uh, you know, concerning uh, an old discussion, a Marxist economist, Jane Robbins would say, used to say, uh, it, it's, uh, it's, it's, uh, it's uh, worse to be exploited by capital is to not be exploited to by, by capital. So should we say the same about uh, artificial intelligence? But I, I really appreciate your, your, your insights and uh, I see uh, how attractive can be this automatization of uh, decision ma making and processes from for policy makers, for managers, uh, and how we we need to be equipped and to keep young people, uh, individuals, uh, to protect uh, our communities, our individuals, uh, especially the the, you know, the the minorities. And uh, the last, a very last point is about global. Uh, uh, governance that we need to do that because uh, also in, uh, in area is a good example of that you know Asian countries might have different views sometimes about the way to use artificial intelligence tools so who should provide this global governance to artificial intel intelligence institutions regulations uh, thinking education etc cetera, etc cetera, is yet to be answered uh, not today. Uh, thank you very much, Danit, for being uh, with us. It was uh, a fantastic uh, discussion. And thanks to the participants for their uh, interesting questions. Uh, to the next. Thank you very much.